You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Hello and welcome to this week's special edition of Crosstalk. I'm your host, Caitlin Poindexter. Hop aboard one of these authentic vintage trolley cars and you can glide through historic downtown Memphis. From Main Street to the Peabody, it's like stepping back in time. This week, we are looking at how these iconic sites helped Memphis grow into what it is today. While nearly all of the trolley cars you see downtown today are antiques, the trolley lines they glide on are relatively new. That's because the last of Memphis' original network of trolley cars closed on June 5, 1943. More than 40 years later, Memphis leaders decided to bring them back and establish the three modern day lines we have today. Now, as I said, the trolleys are vintage and were painstakingly restored to their former glory. The grand reopening of the trolley system on Main Street took place on April 29, 1993. Four years later, the Riverfront Line opened and in 2004, the system was completed with the opening of the Madison Avenue line. I sat down with Gary Rosenfeld, CEO of MATA, to talk about the future of the trolleys. Mr. Rosenfeld, you are a busy man, so thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Can you explain how the trolley system has become a symbol for the Bluff City? Well, the trolleys uh, uh, have been a uh, central point of transportation in the downtown area for many years. Um, you know, every great city around the world has a great transit system, and uh, Memphis is uh, working hard to become a great transit system, have a great transit system to support the efforts in our community as well. Downtown riders can jump on three main trolley lines. Where in town do they go? Right now there's one steel wheel trolley that operates all along Main Street. It goes from the north end of Main Street to the south end of Main Street. It's uh, about four miles long and uh, uh, offers uh, riders the opportunity to visit all of the different types of businesses and residential areas along Main Street. You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Hello, and welcome to this special edition of GHS TV's award-winning talk show, Crosstalk. I'm your host, Madison Riggs. We are in downtown Memphis, home of not one, but three minor league teams. It turns out the Bluff City is the perfect place for these types of professional teams, and today, we will get to know them better. Memphis 901 FC is the newest team on the block. They kicked off their inaugural season this past spring with much excitement and fanfare. I met up with the team's head coach, Tim McQueen, to talk about Memphis' love of soccer. Coach McQueen, thank you for sitting down with us. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm excited to have you all here, and it's, uh, it's great to have you, and it's uh, a wonderful experience for me. We are so excited to have 901 FC in Memphis. How or why was the team chosen to host the team in Memphis? Well, uh, it's a long process. So um, the ownership, Peter Fron, Craig Unger, and Tim Howard uh, of international soccer fame um, pitched the idea to the city. Uh, and then when they got the approval for the city, they went to uh, the United Soccer League, which is the USL. Uh, put together a bid package um, showing the economic impact of what the team could bring, season tickets, uh, the type of uh, team that we would have. Uh, after they got done doing all that, 
Um, they were awarded the franchise uh, last year to start play in 2019. Um, and we've been, uh, we've been excited about it ever since. And a chance here for Memphis, and it's in! And Memphis, 9-1 FC, take the lead here in Talent Energy in the 58th minute. Why was it important to bring this level of soccer to Memphis? Memphis is a really hidden soccer gem. Uh, there's so many people who are, are passionate about the game here. So to have a professional team that is really the second level of, uh, in the soccer pyramid in, in U.S. soccer, to have that kind of quality and that kind of professional player here in the city says a lot for you know, what people think of Memphis and how the fans are educated. And, and to bring something to Memphis, we want to make sure that it's first class. Uh, because that's what the people deserve, that's what the city deserves. So uh, to have the opportunity to bring a championship level team uh, into Memphis was really the, the aim and the goal. And, and we feel like we've, we've accomplished that part of it. And, uh, you know, we have some outstanding players. And it was important to make sure that we have a team, too, that represents uh, the philosophy of the city, that hardworking, honest, uh, good people. Coach McQueen, to say soccer is popular is an understatement. How has the more recent popularity in the U.S. brought more attention to 901 FC? Uh, I think it, it's done a tremendous job of bringing attention to our team here, Memphis 901. Um, you know, there's more kids playing. I mean, soccer's on TV uh, all the time, so you can watch it. So there's this renewed interest and enthusiasm in the sport. Uh, it's a sport where you don't have to be seven foot to play and you don't have to be, you know, 280 pounds to play. It's for us normal people. So uh, it has an appeal that way. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the games on TV, the amount of kids playing, the amount of parents now who have played the game at some sort in their lifetime uh, has all uh, pushed this move forward. Uh, and we've seen the results here at Memphis with the outstanding support we get from the fans. race. What a move oh, by able Najem. to keep it in play. Najem crossing what a play. and it's in. Do you think this has brought more people out to see a game? Oh, 100%. Uh, you know, everywhere our players go and where I've been, people, you know, thank us, one, for having a team. And they're excited about the game they experience. They come out. And, you know, in soccer, it's different. You know, the fans are an important part of the game. They can interact. They light flares. They sing. They chant. Um, so they're an integral part of the of the game. So, uh, yeah, it's absolutely brought people to the stadium. And I think, you know, parents now have had a positive experience themselves in the game, want to bring their kids and expose them to that experience as well. You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of GHS TV's award-winning talk show, Crosstalk. I'm your host, Jemiah Chase. Each week in this time slot, we take a look at different issues, personalities, and events that affect you and our community. In 1919, the first Armistice Day was celebrated on November 11th in honor of the ending of World War I. Later, the name was changed to Veterans Day and it became a national holiday in 1938. Now, in 2019, there are 18.2 million veterans in the U.S. With us today is P.Z. Horton III, the chairman of the board of directors at Alpha Omega Veteran Services, and retired Colonel Elmer Follis, a veteran of the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Colonel Follis and Mr. Horton, thank you both for being on the show with us today. Thank you. Glad to be here. Mr. Horton, what is Alpha Omega Services and how do you support local veterans? Uh, we're a nonprofit agency that supports homeless and disabled veterans. We have been uh, in Memphis for 31 years and have assisted over 11,000 veterans return to society in a meaningful and secure manner. Well, do you serve older or newer veterans or is it all the same? Well, 
it's not all the same, but we do, uh, we do have uh, Vietnam veterans, and we also have veterans from uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. So our age range is from mid-20s to over 80. Well, Mr. Horton, in your opinion, what are some of the hardships that veterans may face? Well, the, the hardships that our veterans at Alpha Omega have faced has been when they returned from their active duty is that they uh, had problems with dealing with society. Uh, some of them have drug issues, some of them have alcohol issues, uh, a number of them have PTSD, a number of our Vietnam veterans have Agent Orange issues. And so um, all of those result in either physical or mental uh, problems and uh, they are with us because they're not able to cope adequately in society. And so our job is to help them through on-site counseling, to help them get to the VA, to get their medical support, and to uh, get them in a, a mode that they can return to society as an active member. Well, Colonel Fallis, can you tell us your story? Were you drafted into the Korean and Vietnam Wars, or did you go voluntarily? Of course, voluntarily. Um, I've flown 400 combat missions. 100 were flown in Korea, and 300 were flown in Vietnam. The difference between those two wars is like night and day. In, in Korea, I flew tactical reconnaissance, with primarily photo reconnaissance, in unarmed aircraft. And we flew all the way up Mig Alley, all the way up to Manchuria, taking pictures where we had several encounters with enemy MiG airplanes, and you're unarmed. That's very, very touchy. Uh, we slept in tents, burned up in the summer, froze to death in the winter, slept on canvas cots, blown up in an air mattress, which was blown up by your Korean houseboy who just had a full lunch of kimchi. And the last thing you said when you said your prayers at night was, Lord, please don't let me get an air leak in my air mattress tonight. <laughs> you never smelled kimchi. <laughs> and um, like I say, we, the difference in, in, in when you go to Vietnam, I mean to, uh, to my missions in Vietnam, I slept in an air-conditioned trailer. I had my you know, own uh, toilet facilities. I had my private trailer all by myself there. And we, we had everything to, good to eat compared to Korea, which everything in Korea was uh, powdered. Powdered eggs, powdered milk, powdered this, everything. And in, in Vietnam was the best food I've ever eaten in my life. So the differences between the two. Now in Vietnam, I, I flew uh, fighter missions in support of America's ground forces, both Army and Marines alike. And we really try to do a good job because, you know, the average age of the American soldier in, in Vietnam was only 19. So you had teenagers fighting the war on the ground, most of them in, in, in Vietnam. So you wanted to make sure that you went in, so we supported them in close air support.